So I've brought a little, a limited amount of candy if someone has a question. Um, uh, I'm happy to throw a piece of candy to the. It's really important to ask questions. On the one hand, you learn, and um, on the other hand, um, the people, if one student has a question, inevitably there are several others who are confused by the same issue, and everybody gets it cleared up if somebody asks a question. Um, this, for some reason, there's a tendency for our graduate students, I don't think it's unique to our graduate students, but in this, in, in this country today, students don't ask questions, and it's a pity. Um, uh, so I don't know what to say. There's something wrong with education in the United States. Well, that's a given. But, um, but uh, it has one particular effect, namely that um, students don't ask questions. It really screws up education. One of the advantages of having a professor rather or a lecturer rather than an online course or a book is that you can ask that person questions. All right, let me, um, because it's so important, let me go back to, and I hope I'm spelling your name right, Emmy Nofa's. Uh, Theorem. Yeah. Oh, you have a question. Hey, here. Oh, sorry. I have a cube. You have a what? A cube, not a question. A cube. This way I have a cube. I don't need any more ways to put that. Um, when you and I were discussing something earlier in emails, and before when I was talking about taking this course, um, you were talking about Mandel. You know, Mandel. Mandel and Shaw, yes. Yeah. And one of the things he did, because I had that book when I went back and looked at it, um, he goes into Dirac's class of paper, Paul Dirac's class of paper, which essentially opens. Paul Dirac right. had several classes. Oh, I know, but I'm thinking of the one that he, he, he opened the field of quantum electrodynamics. And he said, this is the one I'm talking about. He reversed it. Okay. And that seems like starting to go, I mean, you did partly with that issue, because you got into the Anatomy as well. You got into the Rangian and the Anatomy as well. Uh, this seems like it's just a natural way to open the topic up. And I'm just curious why I'm not using Dirac's paper? Well, I'm using that as, the, that's the basis of what we're doing. Well, it's not the equations where you're coming up with. When you jump heavily into equations at the beginning, Kind of because go into the fog of math, where there's a bigger question here is why are we doing this? And I thought, obviously this is not a lot, but I just thought that was he opened it that way, and it seemed like a natural way to open it. Man movie. Yeah. Or is that a lot of assumptions made that people kind of know what all that is? Maybe it's just me. All right, well, I, I don't know. That's I don't know, that's a loaded question. question. I, 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 I don't know what to do with that. Okay. Um, well, what I'm saying is rather than just jump into math, math is, you can, you can do a whole lot of science without doing math, okay? The bigger question is why are we doing what we're doing? And that's not math. The combined relativity with quantum math. Right. But that's what he's trying to do with anything. Yeah. All right. So All right, well, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Emmy Vidova had a theorem. And let me just review that theorem for you. Where um, in the simplest case where we just have one field, well, probably I should do it in the more general case. So phi i prime is, let us say, phi i plus um, epsilon delta um, phi i. And what we're, what we're saying is that the Lagrange density changes by at most a total divergence. So that the field equations remain the same. So this was, this uh, is um, what we're starting.
starting with. And we're assuming the equations of motion, which of course don't change because the Lagrangian under this just changes by a um, by a total divergence. So the change in the Lagrangian then is epsilon t mu t mu, and that then is the partial of the Lagrange density. This is the change in Lagrange density, I should say. Partial with respect to say phi i, and then epsilon change in phi i, plus the partial of the Lagrange density with respect to the derivative of phi i times the derivative of the change in phi r. Okay. Now, we can rewrite this term as um, a derivative acting on everything, namely partial, partial, d mu phi i epsilon change in phi i, and then subtract the part that we don't want to do again. This is this. Okay, now because of the equations of motion, this part cancels this part, okay? This was a question that someone asked at the very end of class. Lagrange's equations are that the, the derivative, uh, that the uh, d mu of the partial Lagrange density with respect to d mu phi i is the partial of Lagrange density with respect to phi i. So that's, that's the equations of motion. And that means then that we're left with epsilon, the divergence of t mu is equal to uh, what's left here, which is d mu of, I can pull out the epsilon, which constant, partial L, partial D mu, phi I, change in phi I. And so that means we have a conserved current, namely J mu, is uh, the change in phi I times the partial over on density with respect to the derivative of phi I, and then we subtract T mu. So this was... Um, this was the I mean, of this uh, theorem. So, are, there, are there any questions about that? <coughs> well, you can ask questions without my inviting you. <coughs> Theorem. Let me give two examples of it. And for sort of recapitulating the end of last of the last lecture, um, the first case is internal symmetry. In internal symmetry, the Lagrange density of the set of fields and their derivatives is unchanged when, um, even when we have phi i prime equal to, I guess I call it a d, d i j phi j. D, I'm not thinking of a derivative, let alone, let alone a covariant derivative, I'm thinking of uh, a representation of a group, and they're often written as D. Okay, so we have a linear transformation of the fields, as an example, and under that, uh, L prime is equal to L. The Lagrange density doesn't change. So in this case, uh, T is equal to T mu is zero. But, um, so let me see, we're skipping some stuff here. So now, 
by just looking at this equation, delta phi i is let me see delta phi i I was thinking I guess if I write it this way I have to actually subtract phi i so delta phi i is dij minus delta ij phi j it's a little more complicated than I thought anyway the consequence would be that jmu is delta phi i which would be dij minus delta ij phi j times partial L partial dmu phi i so this should be the conserved current when I did it last time I left out the I left out I didn't subtract the phi i I'm a little puzzled by that at the moment but I suppose the present version is the correct version anyway what you get is a conserved current and so this is the way internal symmetries give rise to conserved currents in right okay any questions all right let's let's go to another example of this theorem Heskin and Schroeder do the case of a maybe I should redo that because I did it at the very end of the hour very quickly so let's let me do that before we move on okay suppose let's suppose we're talking about complex fields so I'm going to use psi rather than phi just to suggest that it's complex so psi i prime is e to the i theta psi i and now now delta psi i is equal to e to the i theta minus 1 so this is the minus 1 so the way I'm doing it today is more accurate than I was doing it last time and so this is approximately i theta psi i and the change in psi i star then is minus i theta psi i star and so now the conserved current j mu is the change in psi i partial L partial t mu psi i plus the change in psi i star partial L partial t mu psi i star and so this well frankly adding this subscript i is a little is kind of gilding the lily here if we're just doing phase transformation so in fact I think let me make this example even simpler by getting rid of the i because in general what we have so let's just get rid of this so we've got one chart field and this thing is i theta this chart is just terrible i theta psi 
D mu L D mu psi minus psi star D mu L D mu D mu psi star. And in the normal case where, for example, L is equal to D mu psi star D mu psi minus M squared psi star psi plus various interactions D mu psi and psi star. So in this case, in this case, partial L partial D mu psi is just D upper mu psi star partial L partial D mu psi star is D upper mu psi of J mu is I theta. And the theta, of course, you can cancel. D mu psi star minus psi star D mu psi. So this is an example. This then is the electric current and zero is D mu J mu for this theory. Okay, are there any questions? Two questions? No, one question. Yeah. I do not follow. What do you mean from delta psi? How do you go from E to the I theta minus 1 to I theta? You're taking theta in this case. Oh, yes. Theta is small. All the theta is small. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
A nu, D nu of delta nu nu times the Lagrange density. But on the other hand, it has to equal the partial derivative of the Lagrange tension with respect to the field times the change in the field, which is A nu, D nu phi, plus partial of Lagrange tension with respect to D nu phi times the change in D nu phi, which is A nu, the derivative of A nu, D nu phi. Right. Okay. The point here is that A nu is infinitesimal, and also L is a function just of phi and the derivative, space-time derivative of phi. Okay. Well, now we do the same trick as before. In fact, I could have just quoted Nova's theorem, but my notes here on this are the right ones. Let me just make sure. Right. In other words, we can write this as A nu, D nu, delta nu nu L equals, and now we have the first term, partial L, partial C, A nu, D nu phi. Then the next term we're going to write in two different ways. First as big derivative of, and let me pull out the denominator, big derivative of partial L, partial D nu phi times D nu phi, and then we compensate by subtracting A nu, D nu phi, partial L, partial D nu phi. Sorry to say. Are we happy with that? So initially the term was this derivative times that, and now we're writing that as the derivative of the whole thing minus that. Now we have this cancellation because of the equation of motion. This term cancels this term, and so all we have is that this is equal to A nu, D nu of partial L, partial D nu phi, D nu phi. And so now subtracting the two, what we see is that D nu nu, which is partial L, partial D nu phi, D nu phi, minus delta nu nu L is a conserved current. In fact, it's four conserved currents. That is to say, I see I have a typo in the notes here. D nu, T nu nu, D nu is zero, one, two, three. So we have four conserved currents. Okay. Are we happy with this? All right. So this is the conservation of energy and momentum. And let me get to the next page of the notes. In other words, we'll take the energy or the Hamiltonian as an integral of T 
dx, and the momentum, the height component of momentum, has an input of t0i. So these are conserved. Are the zero and zero that mu, mu and mu? Are you just writing them in different? What is the zero, zero, sorry? I'm setting mu equal to zero. Oh, well, in other words, in the lingo that I was using over there, this is j mu, and then I can sort of say parenthesis mu. That's a conserved current. It's the new conserved current. And so you have, what you have then is, is you have then that since zero is t mu, j mu, parenthesis mu, you have the q, which is an integral of j zero, d q x is conserved in time. Remember, because then q dot would be an integral of, literally this is j zero dot plus divergence of j. So this is minus divergence of j, d q dx, which is then the surface current, j dot ds, and you say, we neglect this. So to the extent that we can neglect the surface integral of j, then q is a conserved charge. And that conserved charge is an integral of j zero. Well, the conserved charge here then is, we then have four conserved charges, which are the integral of j zero parenthesis mu, d q x. And now this j zero parenthesis mu is the integral of t zero sub mu, d q x. And so I just raised this index, which is to say if it's a space index, you multiply by minus one. If it's a time index, you just raise the index. So who has the question? So you get another piece of paper. All right. This is Union Oyster House. Actually, it's in Boston. I guess it's from Union Oyster House. So now what I want to mention is that, of course, if the field, if the theory has many fields, then what is going on? Phi i prime then is phi i of x plus a. And now t mu nu is partial L partial d mu of phi i, d mu of phi i minus delta mu nu L. And now one might say, well, suppose your Lagrange density is the Riemann scalar times the square root of minus g. So we're talking relativity, general relativity. Well, then you get a t mu nu. That is the partial of r root minus g with respect to d mu g a b, d mu g a b minus delta mu nu r root minus g. So this gives you four conserved currents in general relativity and leads to conservation of energy and momentum in general relativity. But the problem is that this t mu nu, although it's Lorentz covariant, isn't actually a tensor in the GR sense. And the discussion of this in 
one of the later chapters of Dirac's book on general relativity, which is a very thin book for such a thick subject. Dirac always wrote as simply as possible. I need to pause and tell you a story about Dirac. His wife once asked him, what would you do if I left you? And Dirac replied, I'd say, goodbye, dear. Very witty individual. I'm sorry, what did you mean earlier about not attesting to the GR stuff? It's, this thing transforms as a tensor under flat Lorentz transformations, but not under arbitrary space-time transformations. And the reason is that, for example, this derivative is an ordinary derivative, not a covariant derivative, and this is an ordinary derivative, and there may be some other things. Anyway, the full discussion is in Dirac. But it's still true that something is conserved. It's just that it's not generally covariant. And anyway, I tried to raise that in Finley's general relativity course, and it's spreading, I think, through somewhere. Oh, you're... Oh, it's fine. I'm not even signed up for the class. Huh? Well, you weren't a piece of... Yeah, I wasn't a piece of paper. Oh, Jesus, I dropped it. All right. You have your last name. All right, any other questions? What was the transformation then? Is it, again, the translation, or what was the transformation in the GR case? Well, yeah, in general, in this whole example, it's just a translation, a space translation. It's the same kind of translation. All right, now, I do have some more chocolate in the office. I'm going to bring it. This is leftover from Halloween. This is 2009. You asked the question. You asked the question. Candy tends not to go bad. It's the stomach that goes bad. Okay, so there we have some examples of Noether's theorem, which is an important theorem. Okay, now we're going to go to the quantization of these fields. And let's first look at the Schrodinger theorem. And Schrodinger says that most folks don't do this. I think it's a good idea, actually. So remember, in ordinary quantum mechanics, we have QI, QJ is I, delta IJ. And of course, I'm setting A for it to see one. And we also have QI, QJ equal PI, PJ equal zero. And so what we're expecting is that corresponding to QI, we have some I sub I. And I here labels a point in space, which we're just going to write as phi of X. So whereas in 
quantum mechanics, we have typically a finite number of quantum variables Q survive. Here, um, we have really, since space is infinite, we have an infinite number of quantum variables P sub I, but the label I is a space label, and we rewrite that as a field, that is to say, a function, an operator that depends upon the space point. It will close up in upon time in a little while. And uh, corresponding to PI, we have something called pi I, which is pi sub X, which we'll write as pi. So these are the quantum variables for field and um, just as we had these commutation relations, what we're going to want in the Schrodinger picture is phi of x pi of y as i delta q of x minus y and we're going to want phi of x pi of y to have a zero commutator and the same thing with pi of x, pi of y. And um, just as a classical Hamiltonian might be a sum of p sub i squared uh, plus some v of q well, it would be a sum typically of i equals 1 to n of p sub i squared plus some v of q1 up to qn. That would be the general form. Here, remember um, z in, in a nutshell, in quantum field theory in a nutshell, which, as I said, is a marvelous book of people who already had a course in quantum field theory. Um, it takes the mattress model. And so he imagines that um, that this field looks like this, the sum of the pi squared plus the sum uh, over i and of uh, q of i minus q of i plus 1, or maybe plus, plus uh, what should I say, n hat squared, where we're summing over, over each field and then its nearest neighbors. Okay. So this would be a, a reasonable Hamiltonian for um, for such a such a system. And so we'd expect then that our Hamiltonian to the field theory would look something like this. I'm going to pull out a factor of a half and I'm leaving out factors of two here. We want pi of x squared plus gradient, you see this thing is effectively a gradient term. This is phi uh, minus phi, uh, this is q minus q of the neighbor, so maybe I should write it here at like that, phi of x uh, minus phi of x plus, so I'll just write in half, because that's saying much of what it is, plus perhaps other terms, and so this turns into one half integral pi squared of x plus gradient of phi of x squared. And then usually there's a mass term. Uh, and then um, maybe some uh, potential. So that's, the, our, that's what we generally expect for a field, a scale of field, single scale. And if it's a free field, then we don't have any interaction there. By the way, it's a, I think I maybe a little amusing that, that this mattress model naturally leads to n squared equals 0, which is actually what you have in the standard model. You don't start out with any mass terms in the standard model. They all come from interaction. Um, any other questions? Did somebody ask a question and not get a camera? I'm so absent minded. Right. All right, now I'm going to do this um, 
in a way that imitates the way one can solve for the harmonic oscillator ground state, or the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. What you do for the harmonic oscillator is you have H is a half, let me say Q squared plus T squared, and you rewrite that, you know, as A is Q plus P, and frankly, if we make it simple, it's over root 2, and so this Hamiltonian you can rewrite as, so I'm sort of, I didn't put this actually in my notes, we can write it as, well, of course, as you know, we can write it as A dagger A, and right, and so then what we want is we solve for something, A on the vacuum is 0, and that solution as a function of Q is Q, Q A on the vacuum is 0, and this then is Q, let me put a prime on the Q to indicate that it's a number, and then this is the variable Q plus I P, in fact, when that combines me, it's Q plus I P that's A, and now we rewrite this as Q prime, Q prime P plus I Q prime P, this is a 0, this is a ground state, P is H bar over I, so this is Q prime, Q prime 0, and forget H bar, so this is just D by Q prime of Q prime 0, and so we can miss 0, and so our equation then is D by Q prime, Q prime 0 is minus Q prime, Q prime 0, and so we then say the ground state wave function is E to the minus a half Q prime squared apart from some normalization, and of course I've scaled everything, so N is 1, omega is 1, and I'll probably have made the square root of 2 equal to 1 also. But this is basically how you derive the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Now, I'm going to do the same thing here, I'm departing from Hester and Schroeder because I just think it would be too dull if I said read Hester and Schroeder and then I talk Hester and Schroeder, and so I assume you don't want to, you don't want that. So I'm going to do it a little differently. So now our Hamiltonian is a half integral D cubed X I squared plus phi squared N squared plus grad phi squared, and I inverted the order by mistake, it doesn't matter, addition is commutative, and I'm going to rewrite this as integral D cubed X, in other words I'm going to ape this, in fact the actual thing is this plus H bar omega over 2 is what's literally true, and so, and this thing is actually, it comes from a commutator of A dagger with A apart from constants, constant factors. So I'm going to rewrite this as the square root of minus grad squared plus N squared phi minus I phi, the commutator, not the commutator, the product of that with square root of minus Laplacian plus N squared phi plus I phi, and then plus I over 2, the commutator of pi with square root of minus Laplacian plus N squared phi, and just to make things simple, I'll write it like that. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Okay, so in other words, 
this is playing the role of a dagger, and this is playing the role of a, so this is like a dagger a. Q, instead of being C, pi is P, and, and so I, I P is I pi. But instead of Q, since the Hamiltonian isn't P squared plus Q squared, but rather pi squared plus phi squared plus rad phi squared, we have to actually write it this way. And minus Laplacian is the positive operator. Anyway, you can multiply this out. It's just this times that. And um, what you see happening there is that when this thing hits this, if you do an integration by parts, sorry, let me, I, I see I've been skipping some steps here, even though. So in other words, integral of the square root of minus rad squared plus m squared p times square root of minus rad squared plus m squared p d cubed x. You integrate by parts and you throw this operator onto that. And then this gives you integral phi the square of this, which is minus rad squared plus m squared, acting on v d cubed x. We now integrate this one by parts again, and what you get is integral rad v squared plus m squared d squared for d cubed x. Okay? So that's what I have in mind here. That's, so this time that gives the thing we want. Minus i pi times plus i pi gives us pi squared. And so we've got everything except for this cross term. Well, this cross term, it turns out, is a commutator because of the minus sign. It's a commutator of this object. In other words, it's this object times pi times i pi minus this object times i pi. That's the commutator that appears here. And that commutator is just a number. It's an infinite number, which is one of the sad things about quantum field theory. Um, actually, it's one of the exciting things about quantum field theory, because after all, if there weren't any problems with the subject, then there wouldn't be anything to do. Um, the last thing you want is to be poor. Okay. So now, how do we solve this thing? We want H on now the vacuum to be zero, and we're going to use as a basis these states phi prime, which um, are eigenstates of this Schrodinger field operator with eigenvalues phi prime of X. Okay? Now these states are exactly analogous to Q, Q prime, Q to the Q prime, Q prime. That's what they are, they're those states. And these are the states that are used in pantheonical formulations of field theory. Um, and they have certain advantages. This is the advantage. They have certain disadvantages because like the Q prime states, they're not normalized. The Q prime states have infinite norm. The Q prime states also have infinite energy. Does anybody want to say why they have infinite energy? The, the reason they have infinite energy is the uncertainty principle. Since the value of Q prime is sharp, the value of P prime has to be unsharp or completely distributed. So the value of Q, the uncertainty in momentum is infinite, which means that you have all possible values of the momentum and so the thing diverges. Um, so similarly, these states, which are eigenstates of the field operator, they have infinite norm, and they have, the field is infinitely sharp, so the momentum, pi, is 
is infinitely spread out, and so the energy is infinite. So these aren't by any means physical states. Some, uh, the reason I emphasize that is that I think some people think they are physical states. I mean, you know, finite energy sensible states. They're, they're very useful states. So what we want then is we want phi prime on that equal to zero, and we want to solve that. Now, remember that P prime P from F is equal to 1 over I D by DQ prime of Q prime F. That's how we represent momentum in quantum mechanics. Similarly here, we're going to represent phi prime pi of x f as 1 over i, and now a functional derivative. And I'm lapsing into um, physics notation here, which I guess is OK. So whereas here, q prime is just a number, then q, the inner product of q prime with f is a function of q prime. Here, phi prime is a function. So the inner product of phi prime with f is a functional. It's a number that depends upon the function phi prime. And so this is then a functional derivative. And remember this. Um, I talked about function. I, def I gave you the wiki definition of a, function, of a functional derivative uh, in the first lecture. And um, it's also in um, the class notes of uh, Physics 466, which is this book that I'm writing, uh, the chapter on functional derivatives, if you want to see it written out neatly. All right. So what do we have? We want to say that um, We, we, we want this. We, of course, what we want is this, apart from the constant. I'm neglecting here this constant when I say that. But what we really want here is simply phi prime, the, the equivalent of A. And A is the square root of minus grad squared plus m squared phi plus i pi. We want this to be zero. Okay. All right. Well, watch that. Well, this just pulls out minus or plus. Uh, let me just write it as minus triangle, okay? Because it's one less. I don't have to write the two. Plus m squared p prime times the inner product of phi prime with zero, plus i, the variational derivative with respect to phi prime of x, and of course this is also of x, of phi prime zero equals zero. So the sum of these two terms is zero, and that then says that the variational derivative of phi prime of this inner product with respect to phi prime of x is equal to That, which is minus square root, minus the plus n plus m squared, phi prime of x times this inner product, phi prime of that. Well, this equation here is no harder to solve than this one, which it's imitating. In other words, it's just a linear differential equation. And the answer then the answer then is that the field theory vacuum is like this. Some normalization constant e to the minus one half integral phi prime of x square root of minus of plus n plus n squared. Well, yeah, phi prime of x 
And now if we can make that look a little nicer, if we write 5 prime of x as e to the i p x p dot x, 5 prime hat of p e cubed p of 2 prime cubed, so if you take the Fourier transform, in that case, 5 prime 0 is a normalization factor, e to the minus a hat integral, absolute value of 5 hat prime of p squared, times the square root of p squared plus m squared e cubed p. So this is the wave function of the vacuum field of free theory. And I just thought it would be nice, it was good to show you that, because I was talking about functional derivatives or variational derivatives in the first lecture, and I wanted to give you another example of that. This is the example. An equivalent way of describing this vacuum, in a much simpler way, is just to say that the annihilation operators for all momenta for this field annihilate that state, because I haven't introduced those annihilation operators yet, and so let me get back to what we were saying way over here. The idea was that in quantum mechanics we impose these commutation relations, so what we want now is to have the commutator of phi with pi be I delta, and so how do we arrange that? And the way we arrange that is a multi-variable version of the way we do it from a harmonic oscillator. Namely, we're going to say phi of x, this is again only space so far, we're going to say it's an integral d cubed p over 2 pi cubed, 1 over the square root of 2 omega p. Omega p is the energy associated with momentum p, so omega p is the square root of p vector squared plus m squared, which of course is the thing that occurred here, so this here, this is omega p. It's also written as e p. E sub p is what, so we're going to write this as a sub p e to the i p dot x plus a dagger of p e to the minus i p dot x. This is analogous to q is 1 over the square root of 2 omega a plus a dagger. And the analog here, p is minus i root omega over 2 a minus a dagger. And so we're going to write pi of x as an integral d cubed p to pi cubed minus i square root of omega p over 2 a sub p e to the i p dot x plus a dagger of p e to the minus i p dot x. All right, so those are the field and the conjugate momentum. Now the question is, do we get a representation of those commutation relations that we want? And of course, you know the answer is yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it this way. Now, passing the 
Schroeder use a rather cute notation. They say, well, let's write this as p cubed p over 2 pi cubed squared of 2 omega p. But to absorb this minus sign here, since you're integrating over all p, just let p go to minus p, and you have a minus p here. So they say it's a sub p plus a dagger of minus p e to the i p dot x. This is actually a very cute trick, which I've never seen except here in Preston and Schroeder. I've heard of it. I mean, of course, people do it on their own, but I've never seen it before. Minus i then squared of omega p over 2 a sub p minus a dagger of minus p e to the i p dot x. There's something really awful about the chalk. Do you people all have such good vision that you don't have any trouble reading what I'm writing? Yeah. All right. Otherwise, I'd resort to big chalk. All right. So let's, and what we're going to do is we're going to say that a sub p commutator with a sub p prime dagger, you're going to impose this as a commutation relation, delta q to p minus p prime. By the way, Peskin and Schroeder are going to change this commutation relation later when they switch to a of p as opposed to a sub p. So now we're going to use this. All right. So let's see what 5 pi is. 5 of x pi of x prime. Well, here's 5 of x. There's pi of x. So this is just an integral p cubed p, p cubed p prime over 2 pi to the 6. There's a minus i over 2. And there's a square root of omega p prime over omega p. And then a big parenthesis. And now it's a commutator. So what is the commutator going to look like? Well, this a of p is going to get caught on. Well, let's start with this. That's the first term that I wrote. A dagger of minus p is going to commute with a dagger of minus p. But it's going to get caught on a of p. And so what we're going to have here then is a dagger of minus p, a of p prime. That's going to be one term. The other term is going to be a of p is going to get caught on minus a dagger of minus p. And so that gives you a minus a of p commutator, a dagger of minus p. Close parenthesis. And then we have the phase factors, which because of the Peston Schroeder trick are just e to the i p dot x plus p prime dot x prime. So that's a very nice feature there. Now this thing gives us a delta function. And this gives us a delta function because of this relation. And also a 2 pi cubed. And so this is equal to integral p cubed p, p cubed p prime, 2 pi cubed, minus i over 2, square root of omega p prime over omega p. And now what we have is here, the delta function has a minus sign. And its delta of 
instead of p prime minus p, it's p prime plus p, or p plus p prime. And it has a minus sign because it's backwards. Wait, no, it is backwards. Wait, why am I having a minus sign in my notes here? Yeah, it's because a of p, a of p with a dagger is the plus sign, so a dagger with a is a minus sign. Similarly, the minus sign uh, here, but from there, and so minus delta q, and again, it's p plus p prime. So this can, the minus signs cancel, the factor of two cancels, oh, and I have the space factor, e d i p dot x plus p prime dot x. Okay, now we do the p prime integration with the aid of the delta function. Omega of minus p is the same as omega of p, so this term cancels, this becomes just one. Uh, p prime then has to be minus p, and so this is um, p times x minus x prime, and so this becomes p q p. 2 pi q. The minus sign of the 2 cancel, and I'm pulling out the i. This is just 1. And we have e d i p dot x minus x prime. Of course, this is one's favorite function. It's just delta of x minus x prime. And this is, of course, what we wanted. In other words, we want, well, it's what way over here. It's what we wanted in the beginning was we wanted phi of x with pi of y to be i delta of x minus y. So here, in other words, phi of x with pi of x prime to be i delta q of x minus x. I have a question. Yeah. So, I'm Wait, let me get the chalk. is 
that E is mc squared, and so if we have, and we know from ordinary quantum mechanics, a very short length, wavelength means very high energy. So if we're putting, we're interrogating a particle with a, a quanta, uh, with, with photons, say, of arbitrarily high energy, we can be creating new particles, and then we don't know where we are because we have three particles instead of one, and um, so we can't really measure position. Um, so module, but modulo that, this is a, 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 an N modulo normal, a part of normalization. Phi on X produces a particle more or less at X. In other words, um, from the point of view of classical resolution and throwing out high energy states, it really is a particle at X in the sense of ordinary quantum mechanics. Any other questions? Well, it, one may show, and it's not very hard, you follow essentially the same scheme that I've gone through here, that in fact we have the phi of x commutate of phi of x prime that this is equal to zero. And this is kind of important because this, this is saying that th this is an expression of relativity. In other words, it's saying that you see th these are Schrodinger fields at the same time, say time zero, time independent fields. So they're at the same time. What we're saying here is that they commute at different space points. And that's, that's uh, something that we want in a relativistic field theory because the idea is that if, if you have, if this is a Hermitian operator, so in a sense you can think of this thing as representing measurements at x and measurements at x prime. You don't want them to interfere with each other because they're separate space points at the same time, so you can't have a signal go from one to the other uh, because uh, you have to exceed the speed of light. And uh, so it's comforting that this thing works out to be zero. And uh, let me see if I can just use this as an editor here to show this. So let's make this fine. I was just going to let it go as obviously this is true. But instead it's a one half and now these guys are both downstairs. Uh, and then the rest of this is that instead of having a minus sign and an I, we have, a, and a thing up there, we have a plus sign. And so this means that we're gonna have a plus like that. And, uh, so now this thing is just one half, and this is one over the square root of omega p omega p prime, and now we have a minus sign, and um, but now we have a plus sign here. Well, indeed, minus plus plus is zero, and so indeed this this is automatically zero, so we get zero. So it actually was easier than four. Okay. So this, in a sense, is finally an answer to your question. Your question was, why are we introducing fields at all? Mm -hmm. The reason we're introducing fields is that it allows us to have uh, Hermitian operators that at, at different points in space that are that commute with each other and so don't violate relativity. That's, okay. that's, that's the basic thing. This business of why fields is best described in Weinberg's book. Um, the problem is that it describes everything else also. And so it's a, um, it's, you can get lost. I mean, whereas people say, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. With Weinberg, you can't see the forest for the leaves. Um, 
So, all right. Well, I'm going to put a homework assignment on the board. Um, the uh, I think there'll be three problems. I don't. We'll, we'll, we'll say. Should we say a week from today, or well, I'll say tentatively a week from today, and then next Monday you guys can tell me whether that's too soon. In which case we can shift it to the following Monday. Or so I'll put them on the website. What I'm planning to do is um, introduce one question of my own, and then um, give you. Give you ask you to do uh, two of the problems at the end of um, Peskin. Uh, let me just see what they all is. Uh, yeah, he has the first two problems I think are quite interesting. Um, the third is maybe a little less interesting. I'll hang around in case you guys want questions.